action. We talked about the force length, force velocity. Now let's talk about muscle architecture. It's fascinating. We have muscles of a wide variety of architectures. Long muscles, fat muscles, short muscles, small muscles, and they have profound influence on how muscles act in the body. So let's look at how muscle architecture affects the force length and force velocity curves. Let's talk first about two architectural features, the pennation angle of muscles and its physiologic cross-sectional area. Think about this. Which of these muscles has a greater cross-sectional area? We have a parallel fibered muscle and a pennate muscle. Pinnate after the Latin for feathered, because you can see this muscle looks a bit like a feather. Okay, well, if you cut this in half and you cut this in half, they'll have the same cross-sectional area. But they have different physiologic cross-sectional areas. By physiologic cross-sectional area, I mean how many fibers are packed in parallel and can work together in the force-generating enterprise. You look at this parallel fiber muscle, when you cut that in half, there's your physiologic cross-sectional area. But for this pinnate muscle, if you cut that orthogonal to the muscle fibers, you see it has many more fibers in parallel that can work together per to produce a higher force. So how does a pinnation angle, that is the angle of the fibers with respect to the tendon, affect the muscle's physiologic cross-sectional area? It increases it. When you have this angle, you get greater physiologic cross-sectional area. Now, the level of pinnation angle and the architecture of different muscles throughout the body is diverse. If you look up in the deltoid in the shoulder, you see it has a multi-pinnate muscle. That is a whole set of individual muscles that are fused together into a, a super muscle that has uh, a pinnate structure, so we call that a multi-pinnate muscle. There's a muscle in the front of your thigh that runs from your anterior superior iliac spine down to your kneecap called the rectus femoris, and that's a bipinnate muscle that looks a lot like that classic feathered quantity. The sartorius muscle, we talked about that in the muscle of the day, runs from up here down behind your knee. It has the longest fibers in the body, so parallel fibered muscle that are quite long fibers. If you look in the upper extremity, you see muscles in the hand that have long tendons. And we do that, we have the muscles are bunched up here so that we don't have a lot of mass out at the end of the limb. Imagine having the mass out here, it'd be harder to move. It would increase the moment of inertia of your forearm. So we have muscles that are packed up here near the joint and they extend and actuate the hand and wrist through these long tendons. The same is true at the ankle. So at the ankle here, the gastrocnemius and soleus muscles connect to the Achilles tendon. So these have short pinnate fibers and a long tendon. Remember the long tendon's useful for being a spring and allowing you to bound when you run, for example. Up in the hip, the gluteus medius is a triangular shaped muscle it has a broad attachment on the ilium here down to the, the femur, and it has relatively short fibers and a big cross-sectional area. Gracilis is a muscle on the inside of the thigh. Again, it has long parallel fibers, much like sartorius. So you see the muscle architecture is diverse. So how do we get muscle properties that we can do engineering with from the muscle architecture. Let's take a specific example of the gastrocnemius muscle. And this muscle has two heads, a medial head and a lateral head, and it attaches down into the Achilles tendon. Let's zoom in just a little bit, and we'll look at just the medial head of the gastrocnemius. So if you zoom in on that, you can see the architecture here. We want to know how much force this muscle can generate. And we do that by making the following calculation. This peak force is equal to the physiologic cross-sectional area times the, peak, times the peak stress in muscle. Sometimes we call this the specific tension of muscle that I'm showing down here. 
So if I have a cross-sectional area in, say, centimeters squared, and I know that I get, say, 25 newtons per square centimeter, I can figure out what the peak force of that muscle would be. Well, how do I figure out the physiologic cross-sectional area? We can do that by measuring the volume of the muscle, either by measuring its mass or putting the muscle into a graduated cylinder of water, for example, and measuring its volume. And the physiologic cross-sectional area is the volume of the muscle divided by its optimal muscle fiber length. Okay, but how do we find muscle optimal fiber length? The optimal muscle fiber length is the number of sarcomeres times the optimal sarcomere length. So what's one option for doing this? We know the optimal sarcomere length. In humans and most animals, it's around 2.7 microns. So we could just count them and get this N, and that would allow us to figure out the optimal fiber length. That's a lot of sarcomeres to count, so that's not usually how we do it. I'll show you how we do it by uh, some simpler means in just a minute. So these are some basic muscle properties. Let's dive in again and see how we might measure these properties. So if we want to measure the optimal muscle fiber length, one way to do that is to simply first measure the fiber length. So if I have a muscle and I've dissected it out, I can just put a a ruler down next to it and measure the length of the fiber in centimeters. Is that the optimal muscle fiber length? Maybe, but probably not. We don't know the length of the sarcomeres in that fiber, and so that we need to assess. There's two main ways that we could do this. One is because muscle is striped, remember striated muscle, we can shine a laser through the muscle that I'm showing here. Rick Lieber showed uh, Wendy Murray and myself how to make these measurements. And with uh, the laser shining through the muscle, you get a diffraction pattern that I'm showing here. And the, the length that you can measure in that diffraction pattern is directly proportional to the length of the sarcomeres within that particular muscle. Okay, so from that, we could Remember, estimate the optimal muscle fiber length by the number of sarcomeres and by the optimal sarcomere length, or we could simply measure the muscle fiber length and multiply by the ratio here, the optimal sarcomere length divided by the sarcomere length that I measure with laser diffraction. So that's how I'd find the optimal muscle fiber length. There's some other useful equations. Uh, one of the things that I frequently do in calculations is we'll use a peak muscle stress or a specific muscle tension of 0.3 megapascals or 30 newtons per centimeter. And we'll use optimal fiber length in uh, humans of 2.7 microns. So these are useful equations and you can use those to make calculations in your homework problems that go along with the textbook. So one of the problems with estimating optimal sarcomere length an optimal fiber length with this method is you have to take the muscle out or do surgery and put a laser in there to try to get it. We were really interested in having a less invasive way to do that. And Mike Llewellyn was the first student who worked on this, and then uh, Melinda Cromie, and then Gabriel Sanchez. And Gabriel invented this, what we call the zebra scope. And with this small needle using lasers, we can shine light into muscle so Gabriel is shown here. He's inserted a microendoscope, so a very small microscopic probe, into the muscle of my friend Matt Scott here, former president of the Carnegie Institute for Science, who also volunteered for our experiment. And when we do that, we get a picture that looks something like this. So we can see the sarcomeres in vivo in a live human and measure their lengths. Now, making this calculation, of optimal sarcomere uh, length divided by the sarcomere length we can measure here, we can get an estimate of the optimal muscle fiber length. So now in vivo, we can get these measurements for pretty much any muscle that we can put a little needle into. Okay, so I'm underplaying this microscope a little bit, but when people who care about sarcomeres see this microscope, it's almost like they're having a baby. They see the sarcomeres coming out of the microscope. And, you know, before this, no one had ever seen a sarcomere in a living human. 
So I wanted to just replay this little video of a couple friends and scientists who saw sarcomeres for their first time. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. oh my Wait, days, there look at is. that. There it is. Oh, wow. <laughs> He seems so excited. Okay. Okay. Now, I want to get back to muscle architecture. The fiber length of muscle, and particularly the optimal fiber length, influences the force length curve. So what I'm plotting here is just a cartoon of two different muscle fibers, one in orange and one in blue. The one in orange, will say, only has three sarcomeres. The one in blue has twice as many, six sarcomeres. The force length curve for the orange muscle is, starts at a short length and has a relatively short span. The force length curve for the blue muscle fiber, it begins to develop forces at longer lengths and has a broader force length curve. Notice their peak forces are the same because all we've changed here is the number of sarcomeres in series. So you can see this optimal fiber length, the number of sarcomeres in series, has a profound influence on the muscle force length curve. Fiber length also affects the force velocity curve. So what I'm doing here is if I change the muscle fiber length, but keep everything else constant, the physiologic cross-sectional area and the maximum uh, contraction velocity, you can see that for this long fibered muscle, that has more sarcomeres in series, its peak shortening velocity is higher. So I'm plotting here the muscle fiber shortening velocity versus force. And for these long fibered muscles, you have a higher end-to-end -end shortening velocity. There are more sarcomeres in series. Each sarcomere has its own shortening velocity. And when you put many more in series, you get a higher end-to-end -end shortening velocity. And you can see that in the force velocity curve that I'm showing here. The shorter fibers have a lower velocity, longer fibers have a higher contraction velocity. Fiber length also interacts with physiologic cross-sectional area. Remember that the volume of the muscle is equal to the physiologic cross-sectional area times the optimal fiber length. So if we have a muscle, let's say these two muscles that have the same volume, but one has greater pinnation angle more force and shorter fibers. So this muscle here on the right has longer fibers. It's gonna have a smaller physiologic cross-sectional area and it's gonna have a higher contraction velocity. Here's a muscle that has some pinnation. You see the cross-sectional area, physiologic cross-sectional area is larger. Its fibers are shorter. So here's the force length curve for that green, shorter fibered muscle has a greater force, but it generates force over a smaller range of lengths. The longer fibered muscle has lower force for the same volume, but generates force over a greater range of lengths. Force velocity here, you, again, you see the long fibered muscle has a higher peak velocity than the short fibered muscle. The short fibered muscle, on the other hand, has a greater peak isometric force. So you can see if you were designing muscles and you wanted more force over a shorter range of lengths, you'd pick one with a large physiologic cross-sectional area. And the way our muscles are built, we're packed in with different architectures of muscles that it can achieve these different functions. So we've talked about muscle activation, the basic force length and velocity relationships, and now talked about the effect of architecture on the force length and force velocity relationship we're now gonna talk about muscle tendon interaction and how to make more engineering computations based on these models.